our leadership during financial distress. My name is Shane Cavanaugh. I'm the Senior Manager of Research for the GFOA, and I will be moderating today's webinar. So we're going to go ahead and get started by introducing today's speakers in the order of appearance. Uh, first, we have Robert or Bob O'Neill, who is a Riley Center Fellow um, with the, Charles, the College of Charleston, a former Executive Director of ICMA, as well as faculty for the GFOA's Leadership Academy. So if you're interested in the Leadership Academy, keep an eye out for more information on that as we go, and Bob will be one of the instructors of that event. So we're thrilled to have Bob on this event with us here today. We also have Amelia Clark Merchant, who's the Director of Finance for the City of Roanoke, Virginia. Um, Amelia has been involved in GFOA for quite some time, been very active in our different uh, projects. And Amelia was a member of the Budget Committee for a while and also has been very helpful and active in a number of our research projects. And finally, we have Chris Morrill, Executive Director of GFOA. Before that, Chris was the City Manager for the City of Roanoke, Virginia, and also worked um, for was the uh, City of Savannah, Georgia as well, and was the GFOA president too. So Chris also has a long pedigree of GFOA involvement. Uh, Chris, I believe you had a few words you wanted to say about today's special date as well. Sure, yeah, thanks, Shane. I just wanted to recognize that today, June 19th, um, also known as Juneteenth, is a very special day for our nation. Um, the day that the Union troops, um, a couple of years after uh, emancipation, actually made it to Galveston, Texas, one of the last parts of the Union to hear that the slaves had been free. And so um, it's been a celebration in communities around the country for many years. And I think this year in particular takes on a significant, uh, much more significance. And so for those of you who have a history of celebrating Juneteenth, whether it be a parade in your communities or celebrations or family dinners or at your house of worship, um, you know, we wish you, um, you know, a, a very good June 13th. And for those who maybe don't have a history of it, I hope it's an opportunity for us to reflect on where we are as a nation and what we can do as leaders at the local level to bring more justice and equity to our communities. Um, so with that, Shane, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's get into the plan for today's sessions. The first thing we're going to talk about as organizational lessons for financial challenges. And we're going to be looking back particularly on some lessons drawn from the 2008 financial crisis, but also some more recent ones. Amelia is going to share with us experiences from the city of Roanoke during the current crisis in kind of par parallels with the organizational lessons that Bob will have shown us. And then Chris is going to chat with us a bit about trust in the GFOA Code of Ethics and the role that has in leadership. And then finally, we're going to close the presentation with a panel discussion of some key questions plus questions from you, the audience. So as our next slide here, I'd just like to give you a little context with where this all fits in with uh, GFOA's resources. And what we've got here is the 12 steps through the financial recovery process. If you've been to any of our other webinars on the fiscal first aid program, you've probably seen this. And it was first invented back in 2008 as a response to the Great Recession. We have now updated it in, uh, for today's problems. And I'd like to direct your attention up towards the top where we see that row, that line 10, recovery leadership. And really the takeaway from this slide is that recovery leadership is something that's important throughout the process. There are these three stages of financial recovery you see at the top, bridging, reform, and transform, where first you have to create some breathing room and settle the situation down, which is bridging. You need to start reforming, so doing the making the organization operate better under financial difficulties, and then transform, which is mean you don't want to just get back to where you were, you want to make for a better and more thriving community after you go through all this. And leadership is important amongst and across all three of those different stages. So with that, let's move on to our next slide. And this is our first poll question. And the poll question is, were you working in local government at any time during the 2000, during 2008 to 2010, which is the Great Recession? So just get a sense of who amongst our audience was had some direct experience with local government with those financial difficulties. And so while that 
the folks are answering that poll question. And we're going to move on to the next slide. And I'm going to hand it over to Bob, who is going to talk to us about leading a crisis. Bob, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Shane, and good day, everyone. Um, Shane, you can go to the next slide. What I want to do is just put it a little bit in context, as Shane has indicated, the work we've done to, to uh, give you some at least lessons learned and some approaches that have worked successfully for communities and organizations throughout the country during times of stress and crisis. The, um, the most significant of this is that what we have tried to do is identify um, a number of things that were, have been successfully applied in the communities and in their organizations. But what I would say just as a disclaimer is, is that uh, we didn't find anybody that had a perfect set of solutions and each of these would have to be customized to your own set of experiences. And so what I want to do is just so, sort of summarize those in a way that hopefully you can um, apply or to at least check the kinds of things that you're doing to see if there's some things that might be applied in your context that would be useful to you. So Shane, if you can go to the next one. So the first of these, and again, there are, there are 10 on, this, um, on, the, on the diagram here. The first is um, looking at your vision, mission, values, focused on the purpose. And this really had two dimensions as we talked to leaders and organizations. Um, and just as an aside, it's interesting to know that this has been one that regardless of what sector you're in, whether you're in the private sector, the nonprofit, or the public sector, this has been one of those elements that has been used successfully by organizations to deal with crisis. And for most of us, it has two dimensions. One is, is it frames being able to look at your vision, mission, and values allows you to sort of frame the decisions that you're going to have to make to respond to any crisis. That is, what are you going to keep and what is what maybe you have to change can be it should be shaped by a renewed emphasis on what mission you have, what vision, and what purposes that you serve as an organization. The second is that it, it sort of anchors the organization. What we found is, is that organizations that are more strategy-based struggle substantially in crisis because the assumptions under which your strategies were developed are now in question. And so the, the opportunity here is, is that this sort of vision, values, and purpose become the sort of the centrifugal force that keeps the organization aligned. And for most of us, particularly those of us in government organizations, many of the things, we, we are in a variety of different businesses. And so keeping people anchored around sort of a central focus and a central set of decisions that are going to need to be made in a crisis are significantly important. So uh, this one, I think, is uh, sort of universal regardless of where your organization sits. The second component is acting quickly. What we found particularly significant in the 2008 and what we're seeing emerging in the COVID-19 crisis circumstances is those organizations that sort of were prepared to deal with uncertainty, were there, who had already sort of thought through what happens if something unforeseen occurs, um, they were able to act quicker. The challenge for those who sort of waited is if you did not act quickly, it became where the decisions, the impacts of those decisions were much more draconian, whether it's reductions in service or reductions in force, all of those things were much more, um, as I said, draconian than if you acted quickly. It also helped you prepare to come out of whatever the crisis circumstances quicker than others who waited too long, in effect. The third component, which is interesting, was have a path. And what I mean by a path is that you had a plan, that that is that you surveyed the circumstances, the variables and dynamics that were in play with regard to the crisis, whether it's something like COVID-19 or whether it was the Great Recession, in developing a strategy, an approach that you were going to use that you could communicate and try to make sure that every stakeholder, employees, elected officials, folks in the community were aware of what the actions were going to be when they were going to occur, and what um, impacts that they may have that they needed to take into consideration. Um, what we found is just having sort of a vision that will get better at the end wasn't sufficient. What people wanted to know is what were the steps that were going to be 
implemented that would allow you to sort of articulate what was going to happen in a way that gave sort of credence to the long-term vision. And um, when we get to the questions, I think we could pursue some of that in terms of how some communities sort of built their approach and their path to the chaos. The next was develop migration plans, because one of the things that we found both um, in um, the recession as well as the COVID-19 experiences so far is um, in, in many cases, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring and what was our assumptions today may not be valid tomorrow. So one of the things, um, the development of scenarios that is looking at what happens if our assumptions aren't correct, where can we go from here, where we are, to where we might need to be, and what flexibility we have if the assumptions need to change. And so that migration path was extraordinarily important. And for those of you who spend a lot of time with strategic planning methodologies, for a while we've we sort of got away from developing alternative scenarios, I would suggest the last 10 years in particular would suggest that's a good thing to do is that what we know is our, the assumptions under which we are operating are probably going to be challenged at some point in time, either from um, an, an economic event, uh, a health crisis as we have now, or even man-made or natural disasters. So in all of those cases, having those migration plans available, being able to be nimble and quick to respond sort of goes back to the act act quickly. It's just not acting one time. You're going to have to act in a series of decisions and activities over the course of a period of time. And as Shane um, sort of alluded in the um, introductions, the next one is that what we found that was extraordinarily significant in these communities that helped them adapt to the challenges that they faced was uh, the levels of trust in the community and in the organizations themselves. The trust it fundamentally became the working capital um, that allowed the changes to take place. Um, the higher the trust levels, the more likely the stakeholders could align quickly around what the new strategies were. Um, and what we know is that a huge component of that trust is ethics, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but often we got, I got questions a lot about, well, how do you move the trust needle and it's pretty clear we know ethical behavior and values is an extraordinarily com a big component of that. Being able to um, be transparent, to have performance and accountability, all of those variables uh, create an environment where trust levels both inside the organization and with st stakeholders in the community have a huge impact on uh, uh, the ability to act quickly, to be able to implement things because people will trust that you're a good steward of the of the resources, that you've been a good steward, that you have the right set of visions and values um, that the community identifies with. The one thing that's been interesting, both in terms of um, what we've looked at from everything from natural disasters to this, this health crisis that we have and its translations into economic is, is that no public organization by itself could operate to uh, impact and produce the sort of the outcomes that you want. And in fact, individuals, uh, neighborhoods, business communities, so harnessing the whole, the assets of the whole community is a significant element in sort of the success people have had to deal with this. And in fact, um, uh, part of the materials that, that Shane shared is that transformative capacity really is almost directly linked with the ability to, to identify, align, and motivate all the resources in the community. Um, if you think about it, we used a little bit of a metaphor of, think of it as a bank, is that uh, no one person has enough assets in the bank, but the community as a whole may have sufficient assets to not only respond to the crisis, to, but to be able to transform the community to come out of the crisis in better shape than perhaps it went in. Uh, the obvious one here, um, is sort of take care of your people. This is a really difficult time in most cases, um, not only from uh, their professional standpoints, but from their personal standpoints, um, whether again, a, it's a health or an economic crisis or a, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. Um, and so having organizational strategies already in place, the capacity for the organizations to respond to the needs of the, of the workforce are extraordinarily important. And, you know, I, I, can't tell you how impressed I've been with 
uh, the ability of the organizations to transform into sort of virtual environments and be able to support people in that new environment and providing opportunities for people to not only conduct the services but sort of grow in their own capacity. So taking care of the people and in difficult times where even there's reductions in force, you have to think about um, what's known as sort of survival guilt, the people who are left behind and feel um, you know, who, who are now having to do more things horizontally, perhaps taking on additional responsibilities. So what is it that the organization does to support them and, and then their feelings of what happened to their colleagues. So all of those things are significantly important and the leadership lesson here is that you need to be able to, to uh, respond and prepare people and to support them in a difficult period of time, both personally and professionally. One of the interesting ones that's, um, that comes out of all of this is the organizations that we looked at extensively have been able to sort of take on the sacred cows. Um, things that we have always done and the way we've always done them, sometimes it's awfully difficult uh, because people get comfortable both inside the organization and in the communities we serve on the way things are done. But um, to paraphrase the, the Chinese, um, uh, proverb that the crisis is too important to waste. And in many cases, it allows us to get on the table different ways of doing business, uh, different partnerships that we might be able. To. Um, I'm reminded of of all of the sort of public safety conversations that are that are um, currently underway um, around social justice issues. Is is there a way for us to think quite differently about how we deliver all those things? that is produced fundamentally by the crisis itself and the urgency with which we need to respond to those issues and that crisis. The next one is um, what I call the, the great leadership lesson that we found in talking to folks is uh, knowing um, the timing of what you do is extraordinarily important, that uh, sometimes timing is as important as what the substance of the decision is about. And, uh, so know, knowing when to push hard and when to sort of pause and let people um, adjust to both the circumstances and the new approach um, is an important leadership lesson and one that uh, I think probably many of us have been around organizations where the leaders in the organizations are what I would call the bull in the china shop and they have no sense of, I mean, they may have been great ideas, but the timing was just not great. And so often how successful we are has, has um, is the intersection of a great idea and the timing and circumstances that allow us to get to implementation. And then the last one, which I think is, um, is one that came particularly out of um, the COVID-19 experience is um, two things. One, one is, is that I think we've redefined who we have determined to be essential workers. And, and, um, uh, I, I, my guess is that definition will forever be quite different than it was prior to the COVID-19 and that what we have learned is, is that whether it's the stressors on our public safety or whether it's stressors on the healthcare systems or whether it's stressors on the food supply, um, one of the things that communities have to think about is how do we how do we develop this sort of surge capacity for the particular event and crisis? We've done a really good job over the years of thinking about those kinds of things in the context of natural disasters, but we really haven't thought through all of those in terms of the impacts of things like a health crisis or a food crisis or those kinds of issues. And I think today you're seeing communities and organizations, local governments and school districts and others try to think through how do we deal with that surge capacity? And as, for instance, schools open in the fall, everybody's going to have to think about how we deal with what was likely to be, a, you know, sort of a renewal of the health crisis in a way that still allows us to keep the institutions, the entities, and the activities open. So um, this is uh, one that particularly has been um, identified from uh, the COVID-19 experience. So if you think about those, again, just in, in context, um, you know, we followed a number of organizations, probably more than 100 during the course of the recession. I've sort of renewed my contacts with many of them uh, during the COVID-19. And uh, while a lot of these um, were um, probably available to us prior to these kinds of events, 
these events have sort of highlighted how important it is for leaders in the organizations and the organizations and communities to align around these sort of 10 elements in order to be successful. So with that as kind of an introduction, I'm looking forward to the comments uh, from Amelia and Chris and, and the questions that you might have if you would be interested in a further discussion on any of those um, uh, in any of those descriptions. So thank you very much. All right, everybody. So before we go to Amelia, we have a poll question here for you. And which of the following organizational lessons do you think you've done best with in the current crisis? You should see that. And those organizational lessons are from this slide. So taking a look at the slide here, we pulled some of the uh, um, primary elements from this slide and asking you to pick which one do you think you've done the best with in the current crisis? So you, your strength. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to hand it over to Amelia from the city of Roanoke, who is going to give us some of her experiences in the current crisis. So with that, um, why don't we go to the right slide? And the that is uh, this one right there. And uh, the Amelia, I will hand it over to you to talk about your experience. Okay, thank you, Shane. And good afternoon to everyone. Um, I, I will say in the 20 years almost that I've been with the city of Roanoke, um, as we've come through different challenges, we often think that that's the worst that we could ever experience. Um, and what we are certainly experiencing now is taking us to a higher level of leadership through the difficulties that we're facing. Uh, one of the things that I share with you that I believe we've learned through all of the challenges is that it is critical that we have a clear vision from the very beginning of any of our challenges. Uh, we have to say to our organization and to our locality that a successful conclusion is not negotiable. On behalf of, for the city of Roanoke, 100,000 people and the businesses that call Roanoke home, we have to have a successful conclusion. And it's the responsibility of our team that has been collected to ensure that that happens. Um, and, and having that conversation at the very beginning of what we're facing is critical from the perspective of our city manager, our city council, um, that we share that with the public in an informative way that that is our full intention. Uh, we also have conversations with our constitutional officers, our council appointed officers, our public safety teammates, and our education colleagues that it's an expectation that we're all going to participate in this. Uh, sometimes it's very easy to turn to our libraries, to our parks and recreation areas, and to our behind the scenes departments like finance and the municipal auditing and treasurer's office and say, well, you can find the reductions or take the brunt of this somehow and leave, uh, as was discussed, some of those sacred cows alone. And, and that's not what we can do. It's been critical that we state up front that there is an expectation that we're all going to gather around the table and we're all going to work together to come to a successful conclusion to whatever the situation is so that we can say with confidence that we did the best that we surely could have done. Um, we advance to the next slide. Um, it, it takes time, certainly, to work with the team to understand what that looks like um, and the importance of talking to the team about following through on their commitments. Um, if I think back to just this past March, when we began to look at the impacts of COVID-19 and even thinking back to 2008, when we were, were looking at the potential impact of on revenues and expenditures, um, talking to each other about the critical nature of following through on our commitments of curbing expenses, of being realistic about what we're able to do for the community, and then communicating that. Um, the understanding that we are not able to operate as we typically would have had this not occurred and being able to sit down around the table 
with those who understand what that means and the impact to the community is, is certainly a critical time commitment that we have to put um, on the table. We also find it critical that we communicate with our stakeholders and often one of those stakeholders gets overlooked, and that's our employees, um, but we have certainly with the COVID-19 and the recession previously consistently brought our employees around the table, uh, whether it was in person or through emails or open door policies so that they understood the nature of what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, I would say some of the some of the critical conversations that I've had that impacted recommendations have been with frontline employees who revealed to us better ways to look at what we were doing and better ways to offer services to the public and to have better outcomes. But we don't get that unless we have those communications with employees and offer them a way to certainly give us that input. Um, the public, again, is certainly a critical component to the communication ability that we must keep open. Uh, we, of course, have social media and opportunities for the public to engage with us, um, but certainly having those face-to-face -face conversations minus COVID-19 uh, with the recession was a critical opportunity for the public to come face-to-face -face with us and say, here's an idea that we have, here's something that we could forego, here's something that we could delay or do differently is uh, certainly an uh, avid avenue that we can offer for the public to come forward and have those conversations as well. Again, uh, one of the critical components of communication is upon realizing what impact some of those decisions are going to have on the community, it is critical that we get those impacts out to the community very quickly so that they understand the rationale for making those decisions and also so that they can gauge the impact that it's going to have on them as constituents in the community. Uh, certainly when in the most recent um, issues that we're facing with COVID-19, the city of Roanoke elected very quickly to close our libraries. The impact of that decision on the community was vast. And we've learned quite a bit about how to better serve the community when those types of decisions are made and how to work very well with our school division to ensure that as they are serving the students, that we are also able to the best of our ability to supplement that and to serve the community as well. On the next slide, um, it's also critical that we recognize the places where we're vulnerable. Uh, for the present and for the future. There are certainly those areas where we cannot, we cannot serve the public in certain areas. Um, the impact of something as important to the community as not opening a swimming pool for a season or two seasons, um, the impact of not having a particular library program and the impact it has on childcare has certainly been an avenue of vulnerability that we've had to recognize and have conversations with the public and with our school divisions about how can we work best together to have the least impact on the public and on our employees who have childcare issues as well. We've also find it critical to review our financial policies constantly um, to recognize where we have vulnerabilities there as well, and to talk with our financial advisors and look at the best practices, certainly from GFOA, and to look at how our decisions are going to impact the view of bond rating agencies on our status with them, um, to look at what we can draw back, have conversations about the decisions that we're going to make, for fiscal year end and how those decisions are going to be viewed. It is critical that we have those conversations before we make final decisions about how we move forward and actually enact those decisions. We also recognize that it is unlikely for us to impact every department in the same manner. Um, if we indicated that we were going to require every department to return 5% of their budget, it is just unrealistic. I'm not going to talk to the police chief 
about returning 5% of his budget, just as I would talk to Parks and Recreation. In a critical status, in an emergency status, the, the responsibilities on those two departments are so different that we have to be realistic about what we're able to ask departments to do. And again, from a team perspective, the fire chief, the police chief, parks and recreation uh, director, libraries director, we're all sitting around the table having common conversations about the team approach that we have to take in order to accomplish our goals. On the next slide, we found it critical that we plan for the recovery that we're going to need to experience without the expectation that there's going to be any external relief from the state, from the federal government. Of course, when that relief is received, it is of course planned and utilized to the best of our ability, but we have to be prepared in order to experience successful relief without any expectation of any receipt of that external relief. In the event that it does not occur, we cannot cry because we were waiting for someone else to bail us out. We have to plan for that on our own. We've also found it necessary to, in the, in the event of um, things occurring that we didn't quite expect, um, to overestimate the need for adjustments, to have a safety net in the event. Uh, for instance, with COVID-19, that local taxes did not perform as well as we hoped they would, that we have to overestimate how reduced those local taxes are going to perform and have a safety net in the event um, that they don't perform as well as we hope so that we can successfully end the fiscal year. And lastly, I'd say we, we need to track the success of our recovery. If I think back to 2008 and some of the tools that we used, you know, we were able to analyze those tools and determine what worked well, what didn't work well, work well, and plan for the next critical time, which we're, of course, facing now, being able to use that analysis and some of those tools to help us with our response to COVID-19. Um, and in the event that, of course, we are forced to face another recovery effort in the future, we will need to analyze our response to COVID-19, analyze fully what was successful and what was not, and put those in our toolbox for the next critical time. Thank you for that, Amelia. We appreciate that. And we're going to move on to the third part of our presentation, and that's going to be with Chris Morrill. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, it really struck me as uh, we were preparing this that the concepts that Bob and Amelia have brought up, both the theoretical and the practical um, stance, um, really align very well with our, our code of ethics, our values based code of ethics. Board just adopted last year, and now about a dozen states and provinces adopted. And, and I have to tell you, it's been my experience that when you have to make the difficult but necessary decisions, either day to day or even at a heightened sense we have right now during a crisis, that um, you start with your values. Um, and so I would say our code of ethics lay out five strong values um, with the whole goal of building trust. Uh, Bob talked about how critical trust is as you're working capital to make those, in, to implement those important decisions you have to make and to, to, to get support both internally and externally. Let's just quickly run through those in terms of um, integrity and honesty. Um, think of that in terms of the data that you share, how you communicate um, with your, with other departments, with employees, with your elected officials, com the community out there in general. Um, and can you build trust in that? And the hope is that you know, you've already built a record of trust that, that you can tap into now. Um, producing results for my community. What, what we found, again, again, as we talked to you, um, our, our finance officers, that's one of the key things. You know, people expect you to produce results, and that gives you that track record, and that really builds trust. You know, people can count on you to get things done, and at a time now, your skill, uh, what you bring to the table are more critical than ever. Treating people fairly, 
um, in a big role in um, the, responding to this crisis and others is how are you going to reallocate critical resources? And so if you can approach that with a lens of treating people fairly, um, both you and as you're guiding your elected officials, there's an department, um, others in your, in your jurisdiction, critical that they're thinking about treating people fairly through this. And, you know, you may have to particularly think about who's um, representing the marginalized communities who may not have a voice. How do you think about making sure that they're treated fairly through um, some tough decisions that you're gonna have to make. Um, diversity and inclusion was a clear one. It's interesting, we talked about how critical this was a year ago when, he, when we adopted it. I would say the state of things right now in communities more critical than ever. Um, so this can be a strength. Um, if you can tap into the diversity, um, you know, Amelia talked about the team approach, uh, the diversity of skills and experiences that, you know, a public works director or a library director or a school superintendent brings to the table, and then tapping into the rest of the community where Bob talked about, you know, take the whole community, that type of diversity, but then also thinking about um, how will uh, the decisions that are made and how you implement them impact people of color, marginalized communities, different parts of the community. And last is reliability and consistency. Um, steadiness is so critical at a time like this. Um, and I have to say, um, and you've been demonstrated it here, that going through the 2008 crisis with um, Amelia Merchant as budget director, you know, she was unflappable through all that. And I think it gave people a sense of peace and calm so that uh, you could take a breath and we came up with better decisions, we implemented them better and we learned. Um, so think back at your values. You may have organizational values that your, that your, uh, that your jurisdiction has developed. Um, build off of those. I know in Roanoke, we, before the, the, as we were dealing with the 2008 global financial crisis, our organization values were outstanding customer service, accountability to each other and to the public, and valuing diversity. And those three, we could, that were the lenses that we used that we made difficult decisions. Here at GFOA, you know, we're being impacted pretty greatly, um, our revenues and other things, um, by this crisis. And our, our, our organizational values are learning, collaboration, and trust. We're using that lens and making difficult decisions on where we as an organization can go to better serve you, so you can better serve your community. So with that, um, the criticalness of values, um, building trust, I will uh, turn it back over to Shane. So we can take some questions. Thank you, Chris. And before we do get into the questions, one question for the audience, a poll question. Um, which part of the GFA Code of Ethics is most important? And you get to pick your favorite um, or maybe choose them all equally. And there they are if you just uh, would like to do that. So while you're um, thinking about that, let's talk about the next segment of our presentation, which is going to be a panel discussion. So I have a few questions that I have come up with for our esteemed panelists, but if you have some ideas of questions you'd like to hear them answer, please do use the chat feature to let me know about those questions and we can add those to the list. So with that, um, I'll ask everybody to get back on screen. And Dan, if you could be so kind as to take down our PowerPoints so that we will go to more of the video format for the panel discussion. And uh, while we're doing all that, let's go ahead and get our first panel discussion question out on the table. And that is, how do you maintain your long-term vision and avoid stuck in a cutback mindset who would like to discuss that first. Well, I'll be happy to start, but I um, I was struck by um, uh, the slides that uh, Amelia shared um, of how sort of rigorous that the Roanoke experience was about the, uh, dealing with the short term but having the long term perspective in play. And then secondly, uh, Shane, the, the slide that you started with, which had what I call the cycle of resiliency in these kinds of things that takes you through sort of the preparation, planning, reaction, but then you're starting to think about the transformation opportunities that this presents. So 
if you think about every crisis and sort of a sense of that sort of cycle, uh, both represented in the materials that GFOA has available, but I think in generally thinking about resiliency as an attribute that organizations and communities have, um, you're always trying to judge the tactical things that you need to do to react to how they'll better prepare me to get where I want to go. So that transformative, you know, you're trying to recover, but recovery is, I think, the minimum expectation. The transformation is where I think the vision connects to the, vi the values and um, uh, what I call the, the real sense of community is that we always want to kind of be better in using the crisis as a platform to do that. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else would like to add on to that? I think one of the critical tactics that we have to consistently employ is connecting our our vision, our organizational vision that our council has adopted, uh, along with our five-year operating plan and our five-year capital improvement plan, that we never allow those to not be in the forefront of the conversation. Uh, we are reacting to a crisis, but for the sake of the community, we can't lose the long-term vision and forcing those items to always be on the table brings us back to that conversation. Fantastic, Amelia. All right, uh, any other final thoughts on that one? Or otherwise we'll move on to our next question, which is how do you deal with the extreme uncertainty that goes along with a financial crisis? Would like to lead us off on that one. Um, as part of the honest and, and integrity is you you admit that you don't know all the answers. You you, you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but I think you can convey a sense of optimism that while you don't know what's going to happen next, you have complete faith in your team that you're going to figure out how to get through this together. Um, and and I think the other piece is, uh, as Bob talked about, scenario planning. You know, look at as many scenarios as you can um, so you, that you're ready. Or as, as Amelia talked about, do a scenario where you don't get any federal aid, and how do you figure that out? Do a scenario where you receive it. Do a scenario where, where there's a second wave um, of uh, COVID-19 in the fall. And that scenario planning, I think, um, helps you think through different things and, and gives you some options. Fantastic. Um, by the way, folks, um, Chris mentioned scenario planning. I'm going to chat to everybody a um, link to a past webinar we did on scenario planning. It's come up a couple of times. So if you're like, hey, I'd like to learn more about that, um, you can do it by going to the link I just sent you. Um, anybody else? Uh, Amelia, Bob, have some thoughts on this question you would like to uh, add to the conversation? I would just add, I think, a point that Amelia made is that you know you you have a huge set of stakeholders that you're trying to engage in in that so it's being able to communicate that broadly and to engage the whole community in the conversation so that you know what you're what you're trying to admit is you you can't predict what tomorrow is going to be necessarily but you can you can suggest we have the assets and capacities to deal with whatever it is that's going to show up on our or step the next. Fantastic. And you know, maybe I'll just add a couple points. Is that Chris, you brought up knowing or kind of admitting that you don't know, right? And kind of the uh, maybe conventional wisdom is like, well, you've got to inject this air of confidence and like you know everything. Um, but there's some research that has come out, especially related to the situation that's shown that people actually can accept uncertainty. So they don't need to be told, like, you have all the answers that you're not going to actually undermine your reputation by doing that. And the key is to have, I think, as you guys were talking about, is have the decision making system to give people confidence that you can guide them through this uncertain situation. Right? Not just throwing up your hands and say, ah, oh, I don't know. But instead, you know, you've got a system to help people cope with it. And speaking of systems, maybe one other resource I will share with you all, which is just now out on your chat, is a webinar we just uh, about a month ago about cash flow modeling. So the idea of being scenario planning is kind of looking out over a longer term period 
cash flow modeling is a bit of a shorter term forecasting method. And this webinar tells you how to do that and gives you uh, some Excel models to help you build your own. We've got some very good feedback. In fact, uh, one small town said the mayor has gotten really into cash flow modeling because not the mayor sitting down and doing spreadsheets, but the mayor's like, okay, I get it. I understand where we're at now. So it kind of gives them the mayor this kind of feeling of like having a sense of control over the situation, um, which I think is pretty important. So um, with that, what, unless Amelia, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I didn't mean to cut you off, get something to say. And, uh, other than other than just the the sense of security that it provides not only for for others but you uh, as you find yourself responsible for answering those questions uh, that you are not setting yourself in a position to have to know everything <laughs> it's totally impossible um, but to uh, stop yourself short of reviewing every revenue port on a, report on a daily basis, but certainly to um, look at those models in a manner that helps you answer the questions that are going to be asked of you by those elected officials who are then going to be asked those questions out in the public so that they feel confident in answering those questions. Great. Shane, one other thing is that there's a um, substantially emerging sort of leadership discussion around the higher the degrees of uncertainty, the more diverse the group and the more probative the questions rather than starting with an answer. Um, and often leaders are perceived to have the right answer, right? And it's, it, we now know in higher levels of uncertainty, the, the diversity of the people around the table and the more probative the questions from the leadership group to that the more likely it is you get a constructive set of answers that are applicable to the circumstance. And that's great, Bob. Is that like kind of a, a Socratic method sort of approach? That it, it is. It's, it's the what, where, why, how ah. kinds of questions that um, you start with rather than here's the answer and let's work from there. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because they use the same sort of techniques under um, like software development and things like this. So they exactly. call it designing yeah. first principles. We're using Socratic methods to like basically question all assumptions, which in a time of uncertainty is probably a pretty good time to question <laughs> assumptions about how the world works. Um, all right, well, that's great. Um, let's move on to our next question, which is, what is the finance officer's role in leading the organization through you know, I, I, I'd say with that, you know, finance officers bring specific skills to the table, technical skills, but I think um, that's kind of a given, but you, you have to move beyond your technical skills and really what we're talking about, say, leadership, that, um, you know, you, you, you got to make really tough recommendations. Um, you got to be willing to look at all the, at, at, at the data and give tough information when you have to, um, and, uh, and and really build relationships and build trust. Um, hopefully you've done that before the crisis, um, that you've worked on that. But, uh, but you, you, you know, the, you can't just, uh, you know, sit there and run a great spreadsheet and, uh, you know, get out the capper every year. You, you have got to be building those relationships and, um, and, and really leading, uh, I mean, it is, it, whether you want to or not, you need to lead time like this. Um, I, I think about the, the activities that I've been involved in, especially since March, um, the times that the phone has rang from my city manager and he needed to talk through something. Um, he didn't necessarily need me to tell him what to do. He needed to talk through the options so that we could develop a recommendation. Um, the, the confidence level in his ability to call me and have the conversation was critical, that he didn't necessarily want me to tell him what to do. Um, and, and as Chris, you said, having that relationship, his understanding of the fact that I could tell him what to do was there, but that wasn't necessarily what he needed. Um, to be able to 
to make sure that relationship stays consistent and that when pressed, yes, the, the recommendation is on my desk. Um, and everyone may not like what I'm going to say, but it's available should it be necessary. But hopefully what we're doing is we're gathering around the table. We're talking through those options. And as a team, we're deciding what risk we're willing to take and we're determining the path forward as a team, understanding that the end result, as successful as we pray that it will be, the end result is what we will all have to bear and that we come to that together. And Bob, I'm wondering with you, you know, you led city, city manager organization for, for many years. Uh, how would city managers answer that question? What, what, what do they need from their finance officers? <laughs> well, I think um, um, I'm going to put it in, th in three sort of categories that often what you're asking is the finance officer to be a, a leadership contributor to the ultimate decisions and to bring three things to the table, data, evidence, and discipline. Um, you have access to certain information that is important to decisions. You have access to evidence of things that have worked or have not worked in the past. And one thing that CFOs and budget directors and others bring is there's a certain discipline about the way you go about the things that you do in your everyday that often that rigor is helpful when you get into a high level of uncertainty because you've got all kinds of things coming at you. And so to have sort of the rigor of a discipline process to get you to the decision you want is helpful. All right, excellent. Okay, we're now going to get to what maybe is the question I've been most looking forward to is um, how do you engage the council in a discussion of sacred cows in a non <laughs> way? I've heard Mayor Funkhauser say that sacred cows make the best hamburgers. That would strike me as like the threatening way, but like, <laughs> non threatening way, like what would be how would you approach this sacred cows by? Well, I can just tell you from lots of interviews with folks and, and my own particular experience, it is, it's the intersection of um, timing and, um, and opportunity here. And sometimes the crisis presents both of those things in sense that the timing is good to think about um, doing things differently or stop doing things, those kinds of things. And the opportunity then sort of presents itself um, if you're prepared to do it. Um, I, I can tell you just in interviewing tons of people during the 2008 that they started with these things are not touchable and by the time we got to the depths <laughs> of the dimensions of the recession, those things were no longer from the community standpoint or from elected standpoints off the table for conversation. So you ended up with partnerships that you know are hard to put together and probably in great times aren't worth to some people's views, the time and effort to do it got put together between cities, towns, counties, uh, between school districts, between, you know, um, there were lots of, um, and I'll, I'll describe from, um, you know, where every fire department didn't have to have a hazmat group or a whatever, they found a way to share those resources in a region rather than they have them replicated or maybe not done quite as well as they might have because of lack of economies of scale. All of those things sort of got on the table because the financial reality suggested that you were going to have to do something quite different than the way, you know, we sort of entered 2008. So, um, you know, I think there's a, a lot about the way, you, you know, we get really deep into how you sort of broach those subjects and, and how to do it in a way that doesn't automatically assume that you have an answer at the end um, by engaging people in what the options and consequences of those options are. Um, but I do know when the layoffs started to be identified, people started to get pretty creative about how we might do things together in a way to avoid those kinds of layoffs. And so, uh, um, you know, I think it is timing and opportunity and then good leadership to try to frame it in a way that's, that's less threatening perhaps and it might be perceived. Excellent. Amelia or Chris, anything you guys want to add to that? 
I think we found it helpful in Roanoke to talk about those sacred cows in terms of their prioritization, um, to have conversations not about them being unimportant, but to indicate when we are in a financial, a time of financial difficulty, that we, we at, at a minimum must at least have the conversation about their prioritization. Um, it's been helpful, I think, in some respects to analyze those from the director's perspective and have the director propose changes to those sacred cows such that council didn't see their role as having to modify the sacred cow. Um, that the director found it possible to say we can still deliver excellent service with a modification so that council didn't have to do that themselves um, has been helpful. Uh, but still a conversation in terms of how prioritizations um, are ranked so that the community understands that things are still important, but we have to have those conversations. Yeah, I would say if, if you've done that, that hard work to build a higher level leadership team where you can get uh, department heads looking beyond their own department and thinking of the organization as a whole, it takes some deep work. I know Roanoke's worked on it, but um, to the point where when times like this happen and people start, you know, putting on the table what they can sacrifice, it just becomes that's part of the culture and you work for that. So maybe you're asking, you're not asking the sacred cow for a hamburger, but maybe a quart of milk, you know, <laughs> they can keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> little, little less of sacrifice. <laughs> milkshake is a lot less, not nearly as bad. I agree. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right, guys. Well, we've got a few minutes left, so how about lightning round on one more question, and that is, how do you engage employees in a discussion during financial difficulties? I think Amelia, you'd maybe touched upon this, but maybe there's a chance, like a little more detail on that question. Uh, I know we've we found it helpful to uh, give opportunities for employees to come and sit down and share their thoughts and their feelings with the city manager. Um, the city manager has invited employees one on one or in small groups to come and share their thoughts with him directly. Um, the directors certainly have have the opportunity to have an open door policy so that employees can engage in those type of conversations. Um, and we found it, I think we found it helpful to have those doors open so that employees feel that they have a voice in a time when critical things are happening um, before final decisions are made. And I would say maybe two quick things. One is over communicate. You know, you can never communicate enough. And I think secondly, if you're going to really focus on one group of employees, the frontline supervisors are in incredibly influential yes. in the organization. And you often work with department heads or assistant department heads or maybe high level super those frontline supervisors, they're the ones who are out there, you know, with their crews every day. Make sure that you've given them the time and you and you really focus on them um, as you're as you're, as you're focusing on everyone, but over focus. So, so I, I know from um, from lots of the work that we did, um, lots of organizations described a number of different kinds of strategies that you know, engaging employees that all had the same element is that they sort of framed the question and then tried to create a diverse set of folks from throughout the organization um, to, um, to to tackle them. And then so it wasn't from the manager's office or it wasn't from the finance office or the budget directors um, they were participants but they were not the ones who they shaped the question but the question then in terms of alternatives and evaluation came from um, structured engagement from the workforce and um, you know my guess is that takes a little longer perhaps than you know obviously the unilateral decision but the buy-in i think saves you a huge amount of time on the other end all right. Well, that was great, Bob, and you brought us exactly to 2 o'clock on time. <laughs> so, well done. 
All right, but with that, we are going to conclude our webinar. I'd like to thank everybody for um, participating here. And if Dan were able to pop back up the slides, I can show you all the link um, to get some of these resources that we've talked about, or it's actually quite simple. It's gfaway.org backslash FFA for fiscal first aid. If you've been on some of these webinars, you've probably heard that about a thousand times, but thousand and one. Um, and I can actually share um, about the link over the chat. So if you guys would like it over the chat, we can use that. So um, with that, I'll put that in the chat. And with that, we are done. And I'd like to thank everybody again for their time and wish you a great weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoyed it.